Thanks for watching today's teaching from Community Life Church. Open up your heart and see what God might say to you today through his word. There, actually, happy Father's Day. Can we give a hand to all the fathers? Come on, guys. Man, the, par the fathers are not smiling. They look like mad or something. Oh, my goodness. You know, I'm so, like, pumped up because my wife is gone. I've been eating all this junk food, except when a friend of mine invited him to his house, I ate some good stuff. The rest of the stuff I've been eating just chips and all this weird stuff and fruit snacks. It's bad. Don't tell Renee, please, that I say this. Stays here, all right? But anyway, so we are so excited to continue our uh, Summer in the Gospel series. You know, we've been talking about this, and, and I, it was a great opportunity to have an amazing dad. You know, we have our very own Matt Moore is going to be sharing with us this morning. You know, and... One of the things that I love about Matt, and I haven't said this to anyone before, but, you know, every time that I talk to him, one of the things that happens is when I ask him about his, his kids, that they are all over the country, suddenly there is this spark that happens in his life, and he tells me all about them, and I just get so excited because he loves on them, he calls them, and I know, like, all of you guys are amazing parents. You would do anything like I would do for my kids, and I think just I'm so excited that he's going to be sharing with us this morning, but before that, as he comes up, Watch this video just for you parents or fathers. So let's watch it out. I walked into the kitchen yesterday and I said to my dad, hey, I'm hungry. And my dad said, hi, hungry, I'm dad. <laughs> dinner and dad spilled his peas on the table. He looked right at me and said, oh no, I have just peed on the table. Dad asked me, have you heard about the new movie, Constipation? I was all like, what? No. And he said, it never came out. Who even calls a movie constipation? My dad and I were going past the aquarium. He said to me, how many tickles does it take to make an op octopus laugh? And he said, 10 tickles. Like, what? Oh, tentacles. Hey, Dad, can you make me a sandwich? And what did Dad say? Abracadabra. You are a sandwich. I guess I am a sandwich. Well, uh, good morning. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Um, whether you're a father now today or whether you're a man who uh, doesn't have kids but is uh, a father figure to somebody else or whether you are uh, uh, maybe a mom who's taken on both the roles of mother and father, happy Father's Day. For those of you who aren't fathers yet, um, just, know, uh, just know that um, dad jokes are mandatory once you become a father, so um, it's good to be prepared to know that you're going to go through that life change. Um, uh, but I'll also tell you, there's nothing to prepare for, really, because it just comes naturally. Um, if my son says, did you get a haircut, you know, I really don't have an option to, uh, but to say, no, I got them all cut. So it just happens. Um, you don't have to think about it. If he asks, dad, can you put out the garbage? Well, I didn't know it was on fire. So um, biologists call this an instinctive response or a fixed action pattern, where a biological entity naturally responds in a, to stimulus in a specific way. So if my daughter asks, how do I look? Well, with your eyes, dear, right? And um, if she says, Dad, are you all right? Well. No, I'm half left as well. So just so you know now, so dads, today's Father's Day. They have to laugh at your jokes today. Um, this may be all you get, so enjoy Dad Jokes United, right? Happy Father's Day. Um, 
Fortunately, I mean, Rod was very generous to me about uh, what he, his words earlier. Fortunately for me, I think I'm a pretty good father. Um, and it's been really important to me from the beginning. I think my kids would say that as well. Um, I have four kids, and of course, I could spend the rest of my time up here telling you all the mistakes I've made and all the regrets I have. So, um, but I do think all four of my kids would say I've been a pretty good dad. Of course, not everybody has a great dad. Um, as Kat said, it's almost become a cliche in church circles to point out that a day like Father's Day isn't always a happy day for everybody. Um, maybe you had a great father, but you lost them. Or uh, maybe your father wasn't the man he was supposed to be and caused you a lot of pain. Or maybe your father wasn't around at all. So I recognize today will, might be a tough day. Um, my dad wasn't a terrible dad to me, but he wasn't really a great dad either. Um, but I didn't really know it until later in life. Uh, when I was a kid, he was a hero of mine. Um, it was only when I grew up and realized that some of the things I thought were great weren't so great after all. Um, and later I discovered that while he did a lot of good things, he did some not so good things as well. And in other words, he was a human being, right? Um, and the challenge of not having a great father when you're in church is that we talk a lot about God the Father here. Um, our earthly fathers were intended, as Kat said, to point us to God the Father, to be examples that help us understand our heavenly Father. And by the way, so are moms. Um, but when you have a father like mine, or even a father like me, it makes pointing to God the Father harder and more difficult. Uh, as Rod said, we're in our series, Summers in the Gospel which we've said gives us a chance to know Jesus better. We're reading through the Gospels as a church body, and um, we can use the word gospel in a couple of different ways. Uh, in the series, when we're saying gospel, we're talking about the four books, four first books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are called the Gospels. They're the eyewitness accounts of Jesus. Um, and we want to spend time in those Gospels so we can get to know Jesus better. But... Jesus was the first to say that the reason to know him was because he pointed at the Father. Um, knowing Jesus is knowing God the Father. Uh, and Jesus tells us who the Father is. Uh, in John chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, Jesus was having a conversation with one of his disciples. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So the Gospels tell us about Jesus, and Jesus tells us about the Father. And on this Father's Day, we're going to spend some time learning more about the Father and getting to know the Father better. What did Jesus tell us about the Father? Well, first he told us that God is our Father. Um, it's hard for us who uh, live in a Western society to understand how revolutionary that statement was, um, both for the ancient Jews and for everyone else. What Jesus said was totally new. Before Jesus and mostly after, in every religion, gods were to be appeased at best. Um, the goal was to bribe them or mollify them enough to bless your life. And even the Jews, as Christian said, had an incomplete picture of God the Father. For them, he was somebody you needed to sacrifice to, to earn our way into his presence. It was Jesus who came to tell us that he was our Father. Um, but for us to understand the Father better, we really need to have a real understanding of the other way we use the term gospel, which is the good news. The word gospel means good news. And we can't go through a series on the gospel like we're doing this summer without laying out very specifically what that good news means. Um, so that's what I'm going to do this morning. Now, I will warn you, this is the gospel of Matt. This isn't the gospel of Matthew. Um, this is uh, I, my word, in my words, my summary. So don't take my word for it. Um, the Bible says, search for the truth and hold on to that which is good. Uh, but I think it's important to go through this because 
If you're not a church person or you're not a Jesus follower, um, I think it's really good, a good idea for you to know why you should be. And if you are a Jesus follower, you want to tell others why they should be as well. So hearing this and learning to speak it in your own words is a good thing. So what is the good news? Um, what is this gospel and what does it tell us about the Father? Well, a couple of things we need to know about the Father. The first thing is to understand about God is that God is love. Um, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this because I think most of us would consider this to be self-evident. But um, did you know that this is a distinctly Christian idea? Um, before Jesus, nobody thought that about God. Uh, it's so common for us today to think that, and it's seeped into so many other faith traditions and religious uh, spiritual thoughts, but it started with Jesus, who taught it to his friend John, who later wrote it in a letter that we now call 1 John. And in chapter 4, verse 8, he said, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. But we can't stop there because if God is love, if all God is is love, what's with all the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, right? And what's with Jesus hanging on the cross? Um, God is love, if that's all it is, becomes a one-sided slogan that only gives us part of the picture. There's a second really important aspect to God that we need to understand, and we only like to talk about this when we're talking about other people. Um, that, and that is that in addition to God is love, God is also justice. Now, what is justice? Picture scale. There's an old-timey scale like that, right? Um, justice is the concept that when we do something wrong, there needs to be a consequence to balance out the scale. There needs to be some price to be paid when something bad has happened, has been done. If there's no price paid, then the scales are not balanced and there is no justice. Now, what we all know is true in our hearts, whether we want to admit it or not, is that we've all done something wrong in our lives. Um, in the church world, we call this sin. We've all sinned. Um, now, if you're not a church person, don't check out just because I used a church word. Uh, I'm not defining for you what is right and wrong. For those of us who are Jesus followers, God defines for us what's right and wrong. But if you're not a Jesus follower, go ahead and define it for yourself. And even if you define it for yourself, you know there are times when you yourself would say something's wrong and you've done it anyway. Right? I mean, I think we can all admit that. In an old-timey church, you'd say, you are a sinner, right? Um, by the definition of right and wrong that you've given yourself, you know you've sinned. So have I. So have all of us. Um, so when we do something wrong, what happens to the scales? <laughs> scales of justice. And if God is a God of justice, even if he's also a God of love, then the scales are out of balance, and we can't be in relationship with him. Where there's no justice, there is no relationship with a perfectly just God, no matter how much he loves us. So the question comes, how do we pay the price? How do we get the scales back in balance? Um, that's what most religion is about. If I do these things, or if I'm just good enough, God will accept me again. But God has been very clear there's only one way to rebalance the scales um, when they're out of balance, and that is blood has to be spilled. Something has to die. Um, he's been very clear about that. In Leviticus chapter 17, it says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is, in the, blo it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. So he gave the ancient Israelites a whole bunch of rules and laws about how to balance the scales and how to follow, be right and wrong, um, and they just weren't able to do it. Uh, no one would be. And God knew that ahead of time. He just needed them to know it also. Um, because God had a plan all along. The way he was going to rebalance the scales and reestablish perfect justice 
was to send his son to pay the price for us. Why? Because God is justice, and he can't be in relationship with us until justice is reestablished. But God is love, and he loves us that much that he's willing to sacrifice everything for us. So because of Jesus on the cross, scales are balanced again, and justice has been served. But, of course, it's neither love nor justice if God forces us to be in a relationship with him. So he leaves it up to us. We get to choose. Um, if we choose not to be in relationship with him, if we choose not to have Jesus pay the price for us, if we choose not to have the scales balanced, we can choose that. And Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Now, in the Bible, um, death means separation from God. So if we choose not to be in relationship with him, you're eternally separated from God. That's a choice you can make. But if we choose to be in relationship with him, choose to spend eternity with God, all we have to do is accept the gift of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Accept the gift that allows your scales to be balanced once again. Justice is served, and the God who loves you is waiting. All you have to do is say, I accept the sacrifice Jesus made for me and the relationship with God. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the God Jesus came to tell us about. Not just a God of justice, but a God of love, who is our perfect father. A revolutionary message that God doesn't need to be appeased. He made the sacrifice himself, just as a good father would. This is the father that Jesus tells us about. Now, Jesus points us to this father in a different ways, in the way he lived his life, in the way he loved people. Um, he also did it through stories. And one of the examples of that is what, of what the Father is like is in Luke chapter 15. Um, Jesus was traveling, and a whole bunch of people were with him, and he stopped to teach. And everybody gathered around to listen. And there were tax collectors there. And tax collectors were considered the worst of the worst sinners. And there were also uh, other sinners, people who were unable to keep the laws and to work their way back into a relationship with God. Um, there were also a whole bunch of Pharisees, or religious leaders, or teachers of the law, who claimed to be in God's good graces, not understanding that sin is not only what you do, but it's also in your heart. Um, and these Pharisees were muttering, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them, they said about Jesus, because the Pharisees were focused on a God of justice. And to keep the scales balanced, you don't associate with sinners. So Jesus knew they were muttering, and he told a couple of stories. He started out by talking about a shepherd who had 100 sheep, and one is lost, and he leaves the 99 to go find the one. And he talks about a woman who loses a coin, and she lights all her lamps and searches diligently until she finds the coin. And they both rejoice when that which was lost was found. And as he tells this story, what's the message all the sinners would have heard? Are you telling me that God is searching for me? Like a shepherd who lost his sheep? Or the woman who lost a coin? And if he finds me, he celebrates? Here's what God wants you to know today. This, um, he's not just waiting for you to decide if you want to be in a relationship with him. He's actively pursuing you. He's seeking you. He's looking for you. He's wooing you back into relationship with him. Even if uh, you're not aware of it, that's what he's doing. Then Jesus tells another story. Um, this is a story that even people who aren't church people probably are familiar with. And because of that familiarity, sometimes it's hard for us to understand what a shocking story it was to the people at the time. Uh, what a change in paradigm it was for them. So in Luke 15, 11, it says, there was a man who had two sons. 
Um, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, this younger son wasn't just asking for money. Um, in this culture, it would have been the equivalent of going to the father and saying, I wish you were dead so I can get what I'm going to get in the future now. And the father said okay and divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, in those days, people often ta taught in parables. A parable is just a story with a point. And his audience would have known immediately that the father in this story represented God. And they would have all been shocked at what a horrible son this was, um, that he wasted all that his father had worked for and wished him dead. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs, which would have been the worst thing a Jew could do. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now the Pharisees who were gathered around would be getting the point. Why was Jesus telling this story? Well, he was telling this story to let everyone know that when you're a sinner, you end up with the pigs. The Pharisees would have started nodding their head. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Now the Pharisees would be smiling at this part. Um, this was the good part for them. This is where the father's going to give it to him, right? Was he going to act like the son didn't exist and just turn his back on him? Um, was he going to let him have it and tell him what a horrible son he was? Was he going to make him one of the lowest servants? How was he going to punish this awful sinner with God's own justice? And the sinners would have hung their heads. This was the part of the story, like all the other stories they heard from religious leaders that said they aren't worthy of a relationship with God. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. What? He ran to him? Compassion? Now it was the sinner's turn to smile. Do you mean there's hope? Do you mean even though I've done awful things, maybe, maybe my father will still accept me back? The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine is dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Can you hear the stunned silence? Uh, this was no God they ever knew before. This was no God anyone ever knew before. Is this you? Are you the younger son? Have you walked away from a relationship with your father? Maybe you think you had good reasons. Uh, maybe you just squandered the life you've had so far. Or maybe you just didn't know a relationship with your father was possible. If you've been away from God your father, maybe even wished him dead, deeply entrenched in a life that only brings death, know that God is pursuing you. He searches for lost things and lost people. That's what he does. He is watching and waiting for you to come back, not to punish you, but to embrace you and to bring you back into the family and to throw you a party. Now, but of course, we're in church. Um, so many of us would say we used to be the younger son, but we're not the younger son anymore. And most of us already know that's not the end of the story. There's a lesson not just for the sinners, but for the Pharisees as well. 
Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and he came near the house, and he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has filled the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went, in, went out and pleaded with him. But he answered the father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I can celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property on prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. I've been in that place before too. Um, have you? Where you hope somebody gets what they deserve? Where I'm not interested in joining God's party because it's not a party for me. My son, the father said, are you, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and it is found. Are you the older brother? Um, has a life of abundance seemed to elude you? And I'm, I'm not talking about financial abundance. I mean an abundance of joy and peace and patience and kindness and love. You've served God and you believe in him, but he doesn't seem to be throwing you any parties. God is throwing a party, and he wants you to join it. If we're not in the party, it's not because we weren't invited. That party doesn't always look like a great time. It's not like, okay, accept Jesus into your life and all your problems go away. The younger son still had a lot of work to do, right? Faith thrives in discomfort and adversity, but he wants you in the party too. Think of it this way. When we were lost, when we were out of relationship with God, God wants us to come home, and Jesus makes that possible through the cross. The cross is super important. Um, we all need the cross. It's what balances the scales. It's what allows the grace to come before the Father despite our sins. But the cross isn't the end of the story either. Next is the resurrection. That's the party. If your faith and your walk with the Lord is about the cross, uh, do you say, yeah, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, and it's a good thing. That makes you a believer. But Jesus called us to go farther. He doesn't want just good things for you. He wants great things for you. He doesn't want just believers. He wants followers. Because of the resurrection, God is alive. He walked out of the tomb. He did it to prove he's God and to prove that the price had been paid for all time. The scales are balanced. Jesus rose again. Lots of people saw him die and lots of people saw him back alive again, including his brother James, who became a leader of the church. Um, as Andy Stanley says, what would it take for you to believe that your sibling was God? Okay. Um, probably nothing short of a resurrection, right? He is alive and working today, and he wants us to be a part of that. So don't just stay at the cross. As important as that is, move to the resurrection, and don't just be a believer, be a follower. Um, what does that look like? Well, we've been talking a lot among our church staff lately about are we helping people be believers or are we helping them be followers? What's it look like to be a follower? Um, it's when you're drawing close to the Father and doing what He does. You're a follower when, when you're in the Word and in prayer and somebody who regularly gives and is in community and they're serving. When you're avoiding the things that God says is bad and doing the things God says is good. Um, when you do these things, it means you're in a relationship with the Father. But the point isn't to have a long to-do list. God wants us to be with him so he changes us and changes our hearts to be more like Jesus, to be more like him. A follower is called to love people. A follower is called to have empathy. What would happen if the Holy Spirit poured out a God-sized portion of empathy on our world today? 
Do you know that many of our most intractable problems would disappear in a matter of days? Um, the abortion issue wouldn't be an issue with a God-sized portion of the empathy. The immigration issue, same thing. Conflicts in the Middle East, same thing, with a God-sized portion of empathy. And you know what happens when our hearts are flooded with empathy? That turns into compassion. And compassion, the word compassion means to suffer alongside of. It's not just a feeling, it's an action. It means taking someone else's sufferings as our own sufferings as well. And that means loving others the way God loves them. Yes, he wants you to do the actions. He wants you to talk with him. He wants you to ask for help and serve those he loves. Just like your father wants you to call him today because it's Father's Day. So if you don't feel that empathy, you don't love your neighbor, you don't love your enemy, you can draw alongside the father in word and prayer and through giving and through community, through service. He doesn't want you out there working in the fields unhappy. He wants you in the party. But that's just so he can change our hearts, so we can follow him into the work he's doing in our lives and in others' lives. That's God the Father. The Father who loves you desperately, who is looking for you if you're not in relationship with him and wants you to join the party if you are. Wants you to be more than just a believer, but a follower. That's God the Father. Happy Father's Day. Can you stand with me? I want to pray for you all. Can you bow your heads and close your eyes? Um, are you a believer who wants to be a follower? You'd answer yes to the question, yeah, I'm a Christian. You might have grown up in the church or you might have been walking with Jesus for a while, but you know that this relationship doesn't really impact your life. You want something deeper. You want to join the party, but you're worried that maybe people will think I'm weird, or you may have to have a hard conversation with somebody, or you might need to give up something that you're not ready to give up, but you know you want out, uh, more out of you. He wants more out of you than just being a believer. He wants you to be a follower. If this is you, can you slip up your hand? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Or maybe you're not sure about your relationship with God. Uh, maybe you've stepped away from the church for whatever reason, and you, or you've never really connected. Maybe you said it in the past that you're a Christian, but now you really wouldn't call yourself one. Or maybe you've been living a life you don't think God is okay with, and while you know it leads to places you don't want to be, you don't think there's an alternative. Are you lost and you want to come home? Are you ready to say to the Father who loves you, yes, I want you in my life? If this is you, can you slip up your hand? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful you are our Father and that you've made a way for us to be your children. We lift these needs to you, Lord, for those of us who are in relationship with you. We ask that you help us be more than believers that you help us be followers of the living God who call to us. And for those of us who desire to set aside a life that leads to death and comes into a life-giving relationship with you, we thank you for the sacrifice you made that makes that possible. Please keep us drawing closer and closer to you in all that we do. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Matt, so much for sharing. Let's give him a hand. Come on, guys. Thank you for sharing the heart of the Father. Thank you so much for watching today. For more information about our church, please visit our website at www.clife.church. We look forward to meeting you soon.